Good afternoon and welcome. This is a live interactive broadcast that we're doing with the Heartland Institute's channel. And I'll have with me here, Dr. Stanley Goldenberg, who's a hurricane expert with uh, NHC. And we're gonna do some live interactivity with uh, my X-Red 3D radar. And we'll look at some of the things that are going on as Hurricane Ian makes landfall. Uh, welcome, Stanley, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, and you love giving me honorary doctorate degrees, and um, I'm not I'm not with the uh, Hurricane Research the, Na the National Hurricane Center. I'm with the Hurricane Research Division. They make I the see. forecasts; we make them better. But right, uh, well, but I'm here certainly, on my certainly a good thing because we all need better forecasts. Absolutely, and we and I'm here on my own time, uh, not directly representing NOAA, but I'll talk about NOAA stuff. So okay. good to be with you. I understand. Okay, so. Can you give me a quick synopsis of what's happened so far and what's going to be happening in the next few hours? Uh, well, what's happening now, I wish we could have a bird's eye view. I know there's some live feeds coming from, uh, I saw on Fox, uh, of the storm. Right now, um, the landfall area, and you got to realize the eye, I'm not sure exactly how wide it is that would show on the radar the extent of the eye wall. Mm -hmm. uh, so that red band there, and then if you can picture filling the circle in on the on the uh, southeast side as well, uh, all that region that gets affected by this is getting the max winds, and the to the south especially is getting the max storm surge. So they're getting a wall of water coming in. Not sure exactly; it could be ten feet, twelve feet. They're getting winds. We don't know how high the gusts are, but this was a borderline Cat Five, so Cat Four, Cat Five. So they're getting right, the last I heard of the sustained winds were at 155 miles per hour. Correct. So if now not all areas are going to get those peak peak winds, that's a little spot that gets them. But I'm sure many areas are getting close to those winds and then gust. We forget about the gust. So it's almost like someone pushing you and all of a sudden they just shove really hard. And that's right. what the gusts are. So you've already got this force of the wind and then comes the hammer. And that's what does tremendous amount of damage. There are likely going to be some tornadoes in Florida. And let, me, let me focus just on the landfall. The landfall area, you've got the incredible winds. And by the way, when Hurricane Charlie, Category 4, came ashore there in 2004, mm -hmm. they, the houses that had hurricane-coated doors, garage doors, were night and day from the ones that did not. Because when the garage doors go, the wind comes in starts to decimate the roof, but a lot of windows will go, medium structures are going to be destroyed. We're going to see incredible damage from the wind and then also from the storm surge. The, but let's, I just want to jump to inland and they're going to have this for, you know, three, four, five hours till this, till the main core passes. And they're of course going to lose power, things like that. But let's jump if you move the radar so we can see more inland. And Where fact, are you looking anyway, to go for on the radar? Yeah, I want you to zoom out a little bit so we can see across the, the uh, state. Okay. And, uh, and of course, you can show the path. But, in fact, I sent I sent Jim some pictures. I don't know if you can show them, and I don't know if you can see the, the little – there you go. That's exactly what I want. Now, this is set up for Hurricane Andrew. So Andrew was coming from the east. They said Cat 4 because that's what we thought it was at the time. It was later rated as a Cat 5. But this shows the extent of the impact from a hurricane like this. So first mm -hmm. of all, you have tremendous amount of winds, especially to the right of the direction of motion. So in this case, it's to the north. With Eon, it's to the south. Those are tend right. to be the strongest winds. Although looking at the radar, where you see the heaviest reds, those are going to be the heaviest thunderstorms, and that brings the wind down to the surface from aloft. So they're going to get pretty substantial winds on the north side as well. But back to the uh, other picture. Uh, so if we go back to my um, interactive radar, here we go. This area here um, that I've got... Um, right here this is where the the most intense winds are going to be for absolutely that i the eye wall and a lot of people are going to experience the eye 
So when the eye comes in, in fact, it's coming in during the day. So they're going to be able to look up and see pretty clear skies, no wind. It could go in some areas will go literally to zero. The danger of that is this is not the time to go running outside. And this is a problem a lot of people don't understand. When the winds approach them, they got stronger and stronger. And then the eye wall hit it really ramped up. But on the other side, they're going from zero to those max winds in a very, very short time. All right. I've heard people, I've never been in that on the ground. People who were here in Andrew, who were further south that got the eye, they said it was almost like an explosion. And you yeah. can imagine if the winds, let's go back to pounding, pounding Anthony, and you're, you're <laughs> pushing you and then you're pounding with the gust. And all of a sudden I let go. And then someone just comes and runs into you from the other direction. So one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about are tornadoes. And right now, uh, my interactive radar shows uh, two signatures, a mesocyclone detection uh, and a tornado vortex. And both of these are at this time off the coast. Um, what's, what's the situation? Will tornadoes get worse or, or better inland? Is there going to be some influence of the, the friction inland that will enhance or, or minimize the tornado threat? What's your thought on that? Okay, well, the issue is, if you look again at that other picture, this is one of the many, many, many impacts from the storm is the tornadoes. I already had someone report to me from Boynton Beach, which is just south of West Palm Beach. Uh, just one of the bands, the outer, outer bands, they all of a sudden heard this roar, which either was a tornado or a very, very strong uh, gust uh, from the wind and lightning flash and trees were down, power lines were down. This was hundreds of miles from the storm. And so there's going to be probably some tornadoes, especially as it gets more inland. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons we don't fly the storms when they're over land, because you have a okay. greater choice of tornadoes. So we there's have a tornado be warning that's been issued uh, even very, very far away from the eyes. You can see on this graphic here, um, way up here, um, north of Point St. Lucie, up near Palm Bay, there's a tornado warning that's been issued uh, from 1 p.m. until 1.30 p.m. Eastern time right that here where they, I'm circling. And, and so these can occur very far away from the eye wall. They can right? occur hundreds of miles away where the bands are. And the and actually, in my opinion, I have to check this out, but the further north tends to be more conducive conditions for those tornadoes to form. So as this moves across the state, we're going to see so, we're going to bounce back and forth. With this. We're going to see so much from this. The incredible devastation will be right at the landfall area. I don't even want to think about looking at the pictures tomorrow morning. I hope people have evacuated who were in substandard housing or were in uh, this storm surge area. But we're going to see moderate damage all across the state, flooding. Let's go to the flooding now. Like I said, this picture was from Dr. Hugh Willoughby, who's currently a professor at, at FIU, uh, used to be our director. And I asked him this morning to make sure it was his, and it was. And you can see, well, that's right. I'm pointing at mine. But on the, you've first of all got the winds. Then you have the storm surge, which again, for those who don't know, this wall of water that gets pushed in by the hurricane. And you've got bays and inlets and a very complicated situation. Then you have uh, the rainfall. And we've already been ge getting copious amounts of rain here in Southeast Florida, but across the state, and there's a few hills. And when you have hills, then you can have flash flooding. There's going to be some areas they estimate 10 to 12 inches of rain. It's going to be a tremendous amount of rain. So they're going to see flooding. They're going to see... With it being a very flat area, drainage is a problem, of course. And so as a result, we're not going to see uh, and, and this flooding dissipate anytime soon. And then we've got storm surge to add to that along the coast. So it's going to be a mix of freshwater and saltwater type flooding near coastal areas, right? Right. And of course tons of power outages you're going to see a million or more people easily without power some for short periods some for weeks but also as it goes across the storm when it hits land is going to weaken how much it weakens i guarantee you they can't tell you exactly how much they're looking at the models but let's say it just goes down to a category one so category one can still knock down a lot of trees, still do a modest amount of damage, not devastation, like at the coast, but a lot of trees, especially we already had a lot of rainfall ahead of it. So it 
moistens the ground. You can have trees go down, power outages. Trees can fall on houses. They have a lot of big, big trees up there. And this is going to all go all across the coast. So it's a good chance that Orlando, even if it's just tropical storm, you can have gusts. So in Hurricane Irma a few years ago down here in Miami, we never got sustained hurricane force winds, but we had gusts to 75 to 90 miles an hour and trees were down everywhere. We were without power for weeks. So that's just from category one gust. <clears throat> yeah. Right and, now, the track shows that it's um, going to be a tropical storm as it passes through Orlando, which means winds of less than 71 miles an hour. Uh, but it's still going to dump a lot of rain on Orlando when it passes through that area, right? And, and that's still a lot of wind. Uh, first of all, that's less than 74 miles an hour. Did you ever wonder why a hurricane is 74 miles an hour in a Category 3 yeah, is 111? I said 71. <laughs> I know, but it, a hurricane, a, a major hurricane is 111 miles an hour. Cat 5 is 157. Do you right. know why? Do you know the answer? Not. Right, because everything was done in knots. So it's nice even numbers and knots, and then now we're using miles per hour and it messes the whole thing up. So... Yeah, but it can be, even if it's a strong tropical storm, they're going to get a lot of damage across the state. Mm -hmm. These are people that are not ready. You've got a lot of, like I said, big trees, you know, power outages. You'll We'll see lots and lots of stuff. And, and then it's going to affect the East Coast and possibly go out to sea. Just everybody should realize the intensity forecast. Can I be polite? the best educated guess. Right, so you can see in this view here, once it becomes tropical storm passing through Orlando, it's gonna go through Daytona Beach as a tropical storm, remain a tropical storm, and then go up towards Savannah, uh, and then go inland from there. That's the current forecast track. That is the current forecast, and it's not unthinkable that it would maintain hurricane strength across the state. It's not unthinkable that it could regain hurricane strength when it goes over water again. So all these things are possibilities. We're talking about a several day forecast now. The track usually is decently uh, accurate, but the intensity is so complex. And believe me, they're doing better than they used to. I, I gotta tell you something, when this thing was in the uh, Caribbean and hadn't even become a depression yet, and they were looking at forecasts and saying, this thing's gonna become a hurricane. This thing's gonna become a major hurricane in the Gulf and go and hit Florida. I sat there, I said, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have dreamed of making a forecast like that. Yeah, it was uh, amazing how well the forecast ahead of time actually panned out to be very close to being true. Oh, absolutely. There, the, the comparison between 30 years ago, we had Hurricane Andrew is, is night and day. Uh, right. It's not that we were horrible back then, but the average five-day forecast right now are equivalent to the average two-day forecast 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Andrew, how would you compare this storm to Andrew? From my understanding, this is not as compact as Andrew. It's a much broader storm in terms of uh, its, its a total reach, but I could be wrong. What's your thoughts on that? Well, if you're going to talk about Andrew, let uh, them put up my slide on Hurricane Andrew, which shows why Andrew is very near and dear to me, because it shows my house right. and what happened to it. And he's got, he's got that slide if he's able to get it up. Andrew absolutely was extremely tight, extremely small. Now, as it went across Florida, that's my house, by the way, people. That is that middle top picture is a concrete poured steel rod reinforced gable end ripped in pieces. The bottom left is the house where the entire roof lifted off, flew into the neighbor's house. And on the right is a wall that fell on us that nine of us were under that wall. Upper left is the baby that was born 12 hours before the eye wall hit Miami. How hmm. about that? And yeah. there's actually a link on the bottom if anyone wants to see my store on a National Geographic special. But the issue is, and keep in mind, that's a Cat 5. This is very close to a Cat 5. We have a much stronger building code in Miami. So we're going to see damage similar to this in the landfall area. Very, very scary. And But Andrew was extremely tight. I actually have a picture that shows it, but I don't have it here. Satellite picture of Andrew versus, say, something like Floyd. Uh, Andrew was hit Miami. They didn't even have sustained hurricane force winds as close as Fort Lauderdale. 
Mm -hmm. This has a broader wind field, a bigger storm. It's not huge. People think this one's huge. We've had storms like Hurricane Allen 1980, Hurricane Gilbert, that were so massive, they filled the Gulf of Mexico. We've had storms or hurricane winds go out 150 miles. So this is medium, <laughs> but, yeah. but, right. but certainly not as tight as, as Andrew. Also, Andrew moved very quickly. This is moving a little bit slower, so it's going to dump more rain and it's going to be able to damage a bigger area, but it also weakens more across the state. Andrew moves so fast, it came out on the other side of Florida as a Cat 3. It weakened very, very little, but it, but the lower part is the Everglades. So it had water there and and not as big of a part of state to uh, to cover. So, so Andy, let me, I'm sorry, Anthony, we got Andy. That's all right, Anthony, but, Andrew, people make that mistake all the time. Right, well, we had, I thought Andy was going to be on the call, but uh, and so Anthony, let me ask you a question. Do you think we're having this horrible hurricane because of man-made climate change? Oh, well, I, <laughs> you know, hurricanes, horrible hurricanes have been going on since time immemorial. And, you know, just because uh, climate change has been an issue doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything connected to them whatsoever. In fact, if you go back and look at the IPCC, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, they say they cannot detect any climate change signature um, related to tropical storms. They just say it isn't there. And if you go and look at the data, it's not there. But interestingly enough, last night on CNN, there was a hurricane expert, uh, or maybe it was this morning, this morning with Don Lemon on CNN. And there was this question asked by Don Lemon. And, and we've got it queued up here. I want to play it for you. Oh, I want, to hear it. I want to hear it. Here you go. Can you tell us what this is and what effect climate change has on this phenomenon? <laughs> We, we can come back and talk about climate change uh, at a later time. I want to focus on the here and now. We think the rapid intensification is probably almost done. There could be a little bit more intensification as it's still over the warm waters of the uh, eastern Gulf of Mexico. But I don't think we're going to get any more rapid intensification. If you look here, you can actually see, pretty interesting for your viewers, you can actually see a second eye wall forming around the inner eye wall. And that's basically the second eye wall has overtaken the original eye wall and that should arrest development. Uh, so listen, I just, I'm just trying to get that. You said you want to talk about climate change, but what, what <laughs> effect does climate change have on this <laughs> phenomenon that, that is happening now? Because it seems these storms are intensifying. That's the question. Here. I don't think you can link climate change to any one event. Okay. On the whole, on the cumulative, uh, climate change uh, may be making storms worse, uh, but uh, to link it to any one event, um, I, I would caution against that. Okay. Well, they, uh, listen, I grew up there, and these storms are intensifying. Something is causing them to int oh. intensify. So this storm is just, yeah. it's a massive one. Its effects are also being felt right. uh, in the southern part of Florida. <laughs> okay, you yeah, got to so send me go. that link. That's Jamie. That's the acting director of NASA Hurricane Center. That isn't any old guy. I'm going to email him. I've been in contact right. with him. And he so, basically shut Lemon down and said, hey, we can't attribute any one storm, just like the IPCC says. And Lemon is insistent. Well, I've lived there. I know what climate change looks like. Well, what a load of horse pucky. <laughs> well, wait, listen, Anthony, I'm going to be real professional. For the sake of our viewers, hopefully we have a few viewers. For the sake of our viewers, let me be very clear. We're not talking about climate change in that clip. He's talking about man-made climate change. There you go. That's and right. the climate is always changing. Ocean patterns, things like that, that contribute to the changes in hurricane activity. But, Absolutely. We're, yeah. But let me let me go back to that clip. That was really good. I commend Jamie how he handled it. And I've got to, uh, like I said, contact him later. Just to mention to people, by the way, for hurricane information, let me take a side uh, bit here for hurricane information. The best site go to hurricanes. That's plural hurricanes.gov gov. That's national hurricane center site and get used to there's so many wonderful tools there. And if you scroll down where it's the stuff on, on Ian, that's the other TD 10, there's the stuff on Ian. You can get the track. If you want to know what the hurricane center is thinking, you click on discussion on the left, you'll see the arrival of winds, you know, what time the winds are going to arrive. The storms are so many details. The best, most important one is the click and you can go to it that says key messages, key messages. And they have that in Iglesia Espanol. 
key messages is awesome tells you the main things or points they're trying to get across the hurricane center the other really neat site to go to is to go to youtube or facebook and search for national hurricane center and they not only have posts on facebook but they've been doing video updates and the video updates are really really good that's where i've been emailing uh jamie about them because they were just so thorough and so easily understandable for the public so they go they've been doing them like 12 o'clock and six o'clock each day and you can really learn a lot not just for this storm but in future storms now let me go back to the man-made climate change uh i really hate when we uh change the term and even they say climate and they're thinking of that and climate's a big field and it certainly is not just anthropogenic or man-made the issue is like you said we have not seen those of us who are honestly looking at the data have not seen any discernible signal right and, it's and fact, you know, we've got so much better data now in fact the, the fact that i'm able to display this particular live radar interactive graphic is bounds uh, worlds beyond what we were able to do back at the time of Andrew in 1992. In fact, I think um, just at that time, the very first Nexrad radar came online just ahead of Andrew, just a few days ahead of it, to be able to image that storm. And now here we are, even people like myself, you know, general public, you know, who have technological skills, can get in here and look at this stuff in tremendous detail that wouldn't have been thought of 30 years ago. Oh, now wait, wait, you just said something. Uh, you said those with technological skills. A five-year-old kid can get on and look at this stuff now. It's so available. It's wonderful. And with Ant Andrew, we had an old WSR-57 radar at the Hurricane Center. That was the radar images for Andrew. It was destroyed in Andrew. Then they got the Doppler radar. But to show you how different things were then is we liked making radar loops for study and display. So we would have to send some of our scientists in person to get to the closest radar to the storm and hook up our recording equipment. Wow. And make the, and we have people who were there for Hugo and we've got real stories and Andrew and everything. And they would go there and risk their lives kind of at the weather service, local weather service office. So it's come such a long way. And I'll talk a minute about the instruments we have out there measuring the storm. But let me go back to the anthropogenic climate change. I just, just like saying AGW, anthropogenic global warming, otherwise known as Al Gore warming. But <laughs> the, the uh, I think that's a proper name. But <laughs> the issue is we have not seen a signal. And one of my slides, if he pulls it up, shows the Heartland talk I gave. And you were the moderator in that session, the Heartland talk I gave on hurricanes and climate change. And people can go to that very simple link. They can also look at the uh, Heartland site. And the title of that talk was, uh, what it was a hurricanes and climate change, why the media and some scientists get it wrong. And I really go into a lot of these details and the changes in the observations and Dr. Neil Frank, former director of the National Hurricane Center was on right before me sharing about this stuff. When we make our NOAA seasonal outlook, which we talked about recently on one of your uh, forums, when we did the NOAA seasonal outlook, we have no ingredient in there. There's no contribution from man-made climate change. And we don't see the signal there. And in fact, even when Jamie said, well, they might be getting slightly stronger or something, it's just, he was just trying to answer the guy who was pushing it. There are some models that say the storms might be slightly stronger, but less hurricanes, but the strongest one's a little stronger, but you're talking about maybe five miles an hour stronger, 10 miles an hour stronger, almost beyond our accuracy of measurements. And that's just the model suggesting it. That's not saying that's actually what's gonna happen. The issue is like you said, hurricanes happen. We've had devastating storms as far back as we can recall, even to the time of Columbus, when there were hurricanes out there. And you sit there and you look at a year like 1933, when we had no satellite, no aircraft mm -hmm. reconnaissance. Yep. Uh, wasn't the uh, wasn't the famous shipwreck in, off the coast of Florida, the Atocha, where they got all of that gold? Wasn't that shipwreck due to the fact that hurricane hit that Spanish Armada? 
I, I think I vaguely have heard of it. I don't know the top of my head with it. But yes, there's been many, many hurricanes out there for years and years, and we just haven't had the data. And in fact, one thing I mentioned in my talk, they have the um, Hurricane Dorian, which hit the Bahamas a few years ago. And the press release went out, this ties with the 1935 Labor Day storm for the strongest hurricane ever measured in the Atlantic. Now, let me say why that's a very misleading statement. It's because Hurricane Dorian was the most measured hurricane as far as all the aircraft out there that we've ever had. So they had tons of hurricane, hurricane hunters out there, top instruments, dropping instruments, all sorts of stuff. And then you had the 1935 Labor Day storm, which was measured probably by a few barometers measuring the pressure. You, if you had any anemometers measuring the wind, they probably were destroyed during the storm. So they looked at the damage and they decided how strong this storm was. So we really don't know exactly how strong that storm was. It's just the measurements have changed so much. But let me go back into Eon which Oma was Hermine. You remember that? It was, they, it was This system, depression, was racing against another depression in the Atlantic. It was going to be Hermine. And the one in the East Atlantic got it first. So we ended up with Eon here. But the airplanes were out there. The Air Force was out there. The NOAA hurricane hunters were out there with many of my colleagues. They were dropping. These are some of the most heavily instrumented aircraft in the world. They were dropping all sorts of sophisticated instrumentation. You had special instruments measuring the ocean. You had our unmanned drone, which goes down near the surface, was measuring data down there. You had so many measurements able to more accurately discern how strong the storm was, better center fixes. This goes into the hurricane forecast models and helps give us better hurricane forecasts both intensity and track. So there's a lot going on out there. We were doing some of this stuff during Andrew, but we didn't have the same type of instrumentation. One of the, one of the instruments right. that came out in 1997 was drop-wind songs, GPS drop-wind songs. And these things started in 1997 and blew us away. We had never dropped anything like that in the eye wall of a hurricane. We got to see a real X-ray view these are, these are little little packages of instrumentation that are like um, like a, a Pringles can kind of a type tube. That they drop from the plane by parachute into the storm, right? Absolutely. And they measure temperature, pressure, wind, and humidity, send the data back to the storm. We process it there, back to the hurricane, back to the plane. I'll get it. I'll get it. It's been a long day. Back to the plane. Uh, the data is processed and, and you know, air checked. And then it's sent out to the hurricane center and to the models and to the world. And these things are just absolutely amazing. But we also have the microwave scatterometer that uh, looks at the ocean surface and measures the winds from that. There's balloons that are out there. I, I, it's hard to imagine all this. Day. Plus, we're looking at it by satellite. We like the in situ, the right there measurements. But the satellite also gives us a lot of valuable information. People should always know where there's a storm out there in the middle of the Atlantic, and they're telling you what the pressure is and what the winds are. That's estimated from satellite. That is not right. from planes flying in there. But look at this thing. This is this is current now, correct? Yes, it is. This is live. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the sweep that you're seeing um, where the, the beam is going, that's within about five seconds of the actual data being produced at the Tampa Bay and, uh, and NEXRAD 88D radar. Wow. And of course, right now they're getting those winds, but some of the areas are about to get the eye. And yeah. Get a break for a little while. And listen, sometimes during the eye, people have to change where they're located. I know someone yeah. who was down in Homestead during Hurricane Andrew in this series of, it was the Naranza Lakes condominium, it had the highest concentration of deaths. And we saw how bad the construction was on a lot of things after Andrew. So this guy who works with us at the lab was with his mom and he could hear the hurricane straps start to pop off and the roof ripped off. He threw himself on top of his mom to protect her and it got so, so bad. And then when the eye came, there was only one strip of the condo standing. So everybody kind of congregated there and then came the second part. And that's when it kind of exploded. The picture, I wish I had a picture on screen of that, looked like a total bombed out area. 
Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. And we're going to see some of that. We're going to see because the combination of the storm surge and these winds, the damage is going to be catastrophic. Yeah. As I understand that the bay that's uh, west of Port Charlotte in this photo here is very shallow. So it's going to allow a lot of water to be pushed inland. Is that right? That's exactly true. Exactly true. And this is this is something that some people miss the direct hit of the bullet. They're still going to get damage in Tampa. They'll have some flooding. They'll have some winds. But if they would have had the core of this storm hit that area, you're talking about mega disaster from a very heavy populated area whose buildings are not yeah. really well suited for hurricanes like this. And as I understand it from this interactive photo or graphic here, right here, we have this stream of, of um, uh, precipitation, but that's also indicative of the winds right there. Now, as this system starts to go further inland along the track like this, that section right there is going to start being pushed into the bay as it goes towards the north. And so there's going to be a lot of wind velocity in addition to the extra precipitation. So this area right here, Port Charlotte, is going to get it hit pretty bad with a lot of flooding. Would that be a, a correct assessment? Oh, absolutely. Listen, go back to my uh, my figure of our, the impacts. Okay. And we'll bring uh, that up now. Um, actually, I think you're looking for the map, right? The, yeah, the one that shows the uh, impacts of the Cat 4 hurricane. Okay, right. There we go. There we go. So look at that. You've got incredible winds, devastation from the winds, and that's the red on the shore. That's the red. So that's what's going to get the devastating winds. You have the storm surge. You have the rain. You might even have tornadoes on top of it. With Andrew, let me mention something about tornadoes. With Andrew, we had something called mini swirls. If you've ever seen smoke trails that they do to measure when you have a car or a plane to show how the air resistance is, and you see these little spiral things come off, well, really, that's what we had with Andrew. We had a lot of these little mini swirls that would add 10 or 15 miles an hour. But you add that on top of a strong Cat 4 and you have even more devastation. But they're going to have all these kind of impacts there. And inland, still a decent amount of impacts. We'll see how strong the storm is when it gets in. Again, the slower it moves, the more it has a chance to weaken before it hits places like Sebring, Orlando, and on. So in terms of this storm's impact on Florida, its economy, um, infrastructure, and so forth, what do you think the biggest effects are going to be from this particular storm? Well, the short range, the areas that receive the devastation are going to be a long while rebuilding. It can take years to really rebuild. Oh, now you've got live stuff. The oh, here we go. We've got a live uh, a live uh, camera feed coming up here. This is Interstate 275. Uh, this is the causeway that goes across Tampa Bay, as I understand it. Um, is that right? Oh, 275. Yes, you're right. You're right. So this is Tampa. So this is Tampa Bay right now live uh, on uh, Interstate 275 causeway going across Tampa Bay. And as you can see, there's a Tremendous amount of rain coming through. There's a tremendous amount of, of wave action, white caps and so forth. But this is a good uh, almost uh, 60 miles away from the center of the storm. Oh, yeah. They're not getting anywhere near the amount that they're getting down south. But they're going to get, they're going to know a hurricane was nearby. I'm sure they'll probably get gusts of hurricane force there, a certain amount of storm surge, and certainly a lot, a lot, a lot of rain. But down in that area, you're going to have, again, power outage. So you have power outages, which can take weeks to recover from, and just a lot of scattered damage all along. As far as economy, we'll see what it does to Disney World, Universal, SeaWorld, all those places, and how much it affects them and how soon they'll be able to open. If the damage is you know, very, very modest, then they'll be able to open rather quickly. But it could be more. We don't know exactly what they're going to get. All right. I want to bring attention here to um, what's going on right now with the interactive radar. Where I've, uh, We've got a number of different tornado warnings popping up here. You can see these in these little um, uh, purple uh, polygons that are uh, up near Palm Bay. There's a lot of action going on there right now. 
where they have tornado warnings that are being put into effect from these storm cells that are being generated. And these are actual absolutely. thunderstorms. Absolutely. Yeah. And there are, um, there's going to be a lot more of these happening through the day and tonight as these thunderstorms that are formed. Now, as we get closer to the eye wall, you can see down here we've got, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different either mesoscale interactions, which are large rotating thunderstorms or vortex signatures, as well as individual tornadoes, which show up as these little purple triangles uh, on this picture. Uh, and they're now starting to come inland. We've got uh, a tornado, which is up near um, uh, Port Charlotte, just on the coast there. And so they're going to get a lot of this stuff. And the tornadoes themselves can do a tremendous amount of damage, even more so than the hurricane force winds, because the winds from the tornado are much more concentrated and even higher. Well, do me a favor. Can you work your magic and figure out how wide that eye is, the inside part? Yeah, just a second here. I'm guessing 20, maybe 25. Um, I do have an interactive um, tool here. Uh, just a second here. Well, these, this is for uh, reflection levels. Uh, let's see, the measuring tool, where is it? I don't seem to have it handy at the moment, but let me see here. They probably say it's somewhere online. I'm guessing 2025. doesn't look tiny. Yeah, I would say about 25 miles would be, um, and this would be the, the width of the eye wall. Um, no, the there. inside diameter is, I'm guessing, 20 to 25. Right. Now, remember, this is just the precipitation diameter. The cloud diameter will be less because in the eye wall itself, some of the clouds that are along the interior of the eye wall where I'm running my mouse right now, they're not going to be producing precipitation. Uh, so the radar only spots precipitation. So the eye wall from, from space, when you look at it with satellite, is probably going to be um, narrower. In fact, I'll see if I can pull up a satellite. Satellite is very, very different from the radar, as you know. Say again. A satellite is going to be very different from the radar. Right. We were in one storm where a satellite looked like a little tiny pinhole eye, and we flew in there. And what it was is it was there was only a little hole on the bottom of the eye in the middle, but it was a stadium kind of thing. It just slanted out. So it was more like 30, 40 mile an hour, 30, 40 mile wide eye. I'm actually going to text some people and see if I can get information on the eye actually i've got a satellite graphic here coming up in just a moment um let me um work on bringing this into um the, the stream here Okay, so I have, um, here's a satellite graphic from NOAA. I believe you guys can see this now? Yeah. Okay, and uh, that, sorry about that. Uh, too many, too many streams here going on. A lot of data out there. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see the eye is fairly wide there. Um, it, it, in the radar version of the eye, uh, looks pretty similar. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely not pinhole. The, the reason I say that, let me explain why I, why I mentioned that. And I've, I've texted some people at work with our other handy dandy technology and to see if anybody uh, has that particular information. But the, I just want to make sure my phone is, okay, good. Uh, hopefully someone will say it. The reason that's very important is Hurricane Charlie, which was a Category 4 hurricane that hit them in 2004, almost the same area there. The eye was, if I recall, like some ridiculously small, one of the smallest we've ever seen, about four miles across on the inside. Well, what difference does that make is that the swath of devastating winds was much, mm -hmm. much smaller than this. So this is covering a much bigger area than something like hurricane charlie did so there they might say oh we had charlie before it's like this is not charlie this is big charlie coming across 
and probably stronger than Charlie was when it made landfall. And the bigger it is, the more uh, storm surge it can push in as well. This is pretty so, devastating storm. And I saw some sort of chat. I can't have... read it on my screen. <laughs> well, thank you for the compliment about it being much better than the Weather Channel. All um, we have the <laughs> opportunity to to answer questions. Well, one of the things that we don't do here on this particular broadcast is we don't inject any politics or speculation into it. We try to stick to the facts as best we can. Um, but um, we have an opportunity for questions to be answered from our viewers. If our viewers have any, put them into the chat channel, and we'll try to answer them for you. Well, and let me, Anthony. I'm glad you said that because. There's people that think because of my view on hurricanes and climate change or climate change and man-made climate change in general, that it's political. And it's like, it's not political for me. This is science. I'm looking at the science. I would disagree with people in my own party if I didn't feel it lined up with the most accurate science. So what do we got there? We got a question? And we got a question from Bill Peckney, and he says, where, relative to the eye of the storm, does tornado activity occur? Northeast quadrant? or as I recall from my time with the Navy, Hurricane Hunters in 69. So uh, he wants to know where, where it's most likely to have tornadoes forming. And right now, um, as we look at this interactivity here, we do have a lot of tornado warnings that are going on in the Northeast Quadrant, uh, up near Yeehaw Junction and Palm Bay, where those uh, octagons or those uh, polygons are. So uh, there's that. But there's also tornadic activity going on in the Northwest Quadrant down by Port Charlotte, as you can see here, where we've got uh, these mesoscale cyclone signatures uh, and the tornado reports coming in there. So um, is it just one place or are there particular places where these are likely to have tornadic events? I have to look at some of the studies with that. The issue is you're mainly going to have them along these bands, but there's more convective activity on the northwest quadrant right now. All depends exactly how the storm comes in. If you zoom out just a little bit there, then you'll see there's not as much convection on the south part of the storm. Now, also, I don't know what radar, this is going to be a composite of several radars. Now, this is actually the, this is the live radar from Tampa Bay's uh, Nexrad 88D. Oh, so this is not including the Key West radar. No, it is not. This is just one radar site, a KTBW radar, and it's showing live within about five seconds of that data stream being received. Oh, then I might be giving a little bit of misinformation because you're going to have some attenuation. In other words, the really heavy thunderstorms on the north part can be blocking the view of the thunderstorms on the south part. Okay, so, so I can switch to a different radar view, and well, I can look at the Melbourne radar, for example. Right, Key West, and in fact, I'm going to look at the composite radar a minute and there it is uh no the composite is still showing more convection on the north i've got the composite from the uh national weather service site okay so yeah you can bring that up uh stanley you, i'm having trouble well getting i've got that to... in the back i've got that in the background but you can't really zoom in uh okay, I, I'm well, Difficulty switching to the KAMLB radar here. That's okay, but you know what? I'm, I'm doing from the National Weather Service site. And this is, by the way, an easy way to get radar and satellite imagery is go to the hurricanes.gov, National Hurricane Center site, and at the top where it says data and tools. So you click on that, lets you pick radar, lets you pick also satellite imagery and other kind of things. So it's it's not much different than, than yours is showing. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, we have to be very careful on the plane because we're flying in and you see really, really high reflectivity, very strong radar signal on one side of the storm. We know that in back of it, it might be even worse and we can't see it because it's going to attenuate. That's what they call it. Yeah, this live video we're watching here is from uh, Fort Myers. And I'm amazed that the camera is being functional in the middle of all this. It's just incredible that this technology is lasting. Because it's possible it's from Mark Suddeth. Mark Suddeth goes around with some amazing equipment and plants all these cameras. What channel are you getting this through? Um, I don't know what channel this is particularly on. This is Our producer, uh, Andy, has brought this up. Uh, there we go. It's on the, it's on the channel. Oh, it is the Weather Channel. They might be getting it from Mark, 
and he has all these cameras. He's just evolved with this technology. He's going to measure the storm surge. Uh, the Hurricane Center really uses his data afterwards, but this could possibly be from his because he just sets these cameras up and then he goes back to safety and monitors everything from there. So this is going to have some real terrific imagery. He's done a lot of good work, so I'm giving a uh, shout out to Mark Sutta. But this is, people can't imagine the devastation. It, it's so funny down here, like I said, you just get gusts to hurricane force and you've got trees down. Mm -hmm. And the energy of the wind goes up with the square of the wind speed. So right. you increase it 20%, you're increasing the wind quite a bit. So every little bit you go up does a lot more damage. And then again, those hammering gusts, which make a huge, huge difference. But let's go back with the tornado thing. It can be primarily, in this case, in the northwest quadrant, some, something, or northeast quadrant, but along the bands. So it can be bands 100 miles, 150 miles from the storm, and you can still be getting tornadic activity. So we're going to see a lot of that. Right. So right now, um, we don't see a lot of, of uh, tornadic activity in the Broward County area. Someone was asking about that mainly because the storm is so far away, but there still could be some uh, in the, the afternoon. You know, we can get convective events going with thunderstorms and so forth, and the spin associated with the storm, the Coriolis force and due spin that the storm has. That's going to impart some angular momentum to some of these thunderstorms that are popping up. And when the thunderstorms get some angular momentum or twist in them, then that can spur a tornado. So literally, the whole state of Florida is at risk for tornadoes uh, today. Would that be a correct assessment? I would say a good part of the state of Florida is. Now, we're not going to have, we, like you said, we don't have the convention. Up on the panhandle, maybe not. Yeah, right. But, yeah. In the southeast, yeah, not the panhandle. And the southeast, we're having very few bands come through, but in those bands, you can have tornadoes. Can I jump back? I just want to jump back one moment to the climate change issue again, if you don't mind. Sure. Because that, especially how that CNN report pushed it. When I brief headquarters on our NOAA seasonal outlook, each time I tell them this, it's my standard quote. I say, I don't know if our forecast is going to be accurate when we're calling for an above average season. I hope it's not accurate, but I don't know if it's going to be accurate. But one thing I can tell you with 100% certainty that if we have a devastating storm, someone will blame it on man-made climate change. Oh, of course. And I am right every year. And the issue is there was someone who came on some politician and I won't say which party they're with. That way this isn't uh partisan but it, someone came on and they were so excited that they had passed these climate regulations saying that now we're gonna in a sense put a stop to things like this and it was like you've got to be kidding you know you're not you have devastating hurricanes as far back as we can remember and even if it was stopping something that they say is happening it's not going to stop devastating hurricanes anyway no how, no way. We're going to have these things. And people see they're seeing more of them. People have a very short memory. And I wrote a paper for the Journal of Science, which I talk about in that talk, uh, the Las Vegas talk, that talked about the multi-decadal scale fluctuation of hurricane activity. That means we have decades worth of above normal activity overall, and then decades of below normal activity overall. Not that we don't have some strong storms in the below normal, just not as many of them. And then in 1995, we switched back to this above normal era. We call it high activity era. Well, believe it or not, a lot of studies out there, they start their study in the low activity era and they end it in the high activity era, giving them a trend. That would be I'm like starting picking of the data. Right. That would be like starting temperature measurements in January, going to August. And going to all the papers and say, if this continues, if you don't do something about this, you all are going to die in a few months. It keeps getting hotter and hotter. And they look at them and say, no, no, it's going to get colder again. This is a cycle. And that's how it is with the hurricane activity. And again, all the different ways we measure them now compared to how we measure them in the past is just night and day, night and day, just totally, totally different kind of thing. So I just want to assure people. We're going to see storms like this. We're going to see devastating events like this. We're going to see tornadoes. We're going to see floods. We're going to see all sorts of things because we've been seeing those things. The biggest man-made changes we see, so there is 
are you ready for this quote? There is substantially more damage and devastation from hurricanes due to man-made causes. Now, you know what the man-made cause is? Building in places you shouldn't. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just the buildup along the coast, which, of course, Pilkey and Lancy did a lot of work with. So you have the 1926 Miami hurricane, the great Miami hurricane, which for you Jewish watchers happened to hit on Yom Kippur, which is my Jewish birthday, Jewish calendar birthday. But it hit on Yom Kippur, hit Miami and caused tremendous devastation. But there wasn't much here at that point. If the same storm would hit today, it'd probably easily be $100 billion in damage. Totally yeah. different because of the buildup. And these houses, they build on the coast, they get wiped out, they build them again. So that's where we're having a lot more devastation, a lot more impact. You know, why did we have the devastation in New Orleans? Because New Orleans is built in a fishbowl with the levees. Right. It's below, we knew that one day, in fact, when they watched my Hurricane Andrew video, which with that link was on the uh, my Hurricane Andrew damage slide, mm -hmm. and they watched that after the story about Hurricane Andrew, it says this, and because Andrew went across the state, stayed a major hurricane, grew much larger, and then hit Louisiana, but west of New Orleans. So New Orleans did not get a major impact. And they said, gee, what would happen if a major hurricane hit New Orleans? Ten years later, that was issued in 1995, ten years later, we had Katrina. And the issue is when those levees went and it didn't take much to break them, then you just fill up the city. And sadly, a lot of people did not heed the evacuation. That's why when you have the flooding, that's not storm surge flooding, that's levee flooding. But when you have storm surge flooding in these areas, you need to do something. In fact, do you know why we have all these canals in Florida? Anthony. Um, no, I'll let you answer that question because I'm okay. not a Florida resident. You are. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's hurricane history. So I'm going to, as my wife says, educate you. And so if you look to the right of your radar picture, you see Lake Okeechobee. And in the late 20s, there was a hurricane that came across. I think it was 1928. Hurricane came across and the storm surge affected the lake and basically almost pushed the lake out and just flooded all the towns around. So like Pahokee and Indian Town and so forth, those were all flooded? Yes, everything was flooded. I think it came from the east, I'd have to look specifically, but it was Lake Okeechobee. And basically, I think over a thousand people died, could have been several yeah. thousand. So they uh, at one point decided to build canals. So if they needed to, they could lower the level of the lake if a devastating hurricane was coming that way. Yeah, now I want to tell you, I, about um, a year ago, I drove through Clewiston on 27 there down through Belle Glade. And Did you have any alligator meat at the restaurants there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. But what I one of the things I noticed is that right here where my mouse is, this area here is a giant levee, a giant dike. Yeah. And, and, and the lake is actually higher than the surrounding land. And so as a result, um, you know, if that thing ever gets breached, they're going to have a massive flood on their hands. And, and that's a man-made thing. If, if we have a hurricane come through and cause the lake to fill up or spill over or get blown over or whatever, and, the, and that dam gets breached, that earthen dam, they're going to blame it on man-made climate change, when in fact it's man-made infrastructure failing that would be the real reason. Exactly. And this is I'm all for science. I'm for investigating things. There was the theory of the increased CO2 causing tremendous changes, but there's been a lot of research since then. And there's pros and cons. The biggest thing I would come against, let me say this, and I can be quoted as this, it is a blatant lie in the media and elsewhere that there's only a few fringe scientists that disagree with the catastrophic man-made climate change theories. Well, you know That's how it is. It used to be that if you didn't publish or you'd perish, you know, in the university and the environment. Well, now that climate change has become big business, huge amounts of money are being uh, given towards climate change research. And the problem is, is that if you start, if you start finding things that don't necessarily agree with what that funding stream is designed to do, 
you're going to be against the grain and then you're not going to get the next funding level. And so it's it, it just that simple, you know, money talks, bullshit walks kind of thing. We are in that kind of a mode with science. And in fact, um, way back in uh, many people remember uh, Eisenhower's famous speech where he was uh, giving his farewell speech and he talked about the military industrial complex. Well, in the next sentence that you don't hear so much about, in the next paragraph, he talked about the fact that science has become beholden to government funding. And so if the government's along this particular line, you know, like with the National Science Foundation and so forth and so on, and they're sending money out for climate change research, what are you going to do if you find climate change data that says, well, this isn't exactly in line with what everybody else is talking about, and you publish on it, you become a pariah. And that's what's happened to a lot of them scientists out there. They've become pariahs for speaking out simply by following the science, as they like to say. Well, let me let me comment on that without being political. I made the statement that it's a blatant lie that only a few fringe scientists disagree with it. I would also be dishonest if I didn't say there were some scientists I respect that do, from their research, believe that there's going to be substantial changes. I don't happen to agree with some of those results, but there are people that do believe that, and not all of them are doing it in a, in a corrupt way. But the issue is, the, the big lie is, it's settled science. Right. That everybody agrees with it. That's absolutely erroneous. But by the way, I just have the latest news in, getting back to Hurricane Ian, is that the eye diameter from the vortex message, this is from the aircraft, Three, right, eight, three times. Uh, wait, I thought, give me one second. Uh, okay. I'm communicating with my lab. Uh, Here we go, Naples Pier Live. Look at this. It's just huge amount of surge flowing over that pier. Oh, I, oh, oh, that's Naples. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, the circular radius of the eye the diameter, I'm sorry, the diameter, 34 nautical miles. There you go. So that is a, and and of course, that's not the circle of the devastation. Circle of the devastation is from that 34 mi nautical miles out about 10 more miles or 15 more miles to include the eye wall. So much, much bigger. The area of devastation is going to be much, much larger. So do we have another question or just comments here? Well, I, I don't know if we've got another question. I don't see any in the comments, but I do want to make a comment about media coverage and storms and so forth. There's an impression out there that storms are getting worse. You know, part of that has to do with the fact that storm coverage has become uh, omnipotent, essentially. It's everywhere. I mean, 30 years, 35 years ago, when I first started doing television meteorology live on the air, I had a teletype machine. You know, clack, 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 and it printed <laughs> fax out. Fax machine and teletype, right? Right. I had an all-in fax machine and a teletype. I didn't have any graphics. There weren't storm chasers. Storm chasers didn't exist 35 years ago. Doppler radar didn't exist 35 years ago. Detailed satellite imagery didn't exist 35 years ago. We got really kind of fuzzy-looking satellite imagery. So what's happened is, is our ability to spot and report on storms has increased tremendously. And one of the biggest tools for spotting storms that gives people on the news the idea that storms are getting worse is this right here, a cell phone. There are millions of cell phones in the hands of people and they go out and they shoot video. Hey, look, this tornado touched down in the middle of this cornfield in, in somewhere Iowa. You wouldn't have seen that 35 years ago, but they have those now. And so literally with electronics, we can capture a storm event in the middle of Iowa out in the middle of a cornfield that normally no one would ever look at and send it over to CNN and they've got it on CNN and Don Lemon is all saying, hey, look, tornado, it's climate change. That's the kind of stuff that goes on right now. And that's why people are alarmed about climate change and storms because the coverage has increased so much. Well, it's not just the measurements and the coverage, it's what they say. Because when they say it again and again and again, this is from man-made climate of course they say climate change and you know me i hate when they just say climate change they're talking about man-made climate change anthropogenic climate change and when they say that again and again and again and again there's people that start to believe it unless they really look at the data as far as the co the coverage like i mentioned earlier the difference in and i hope people look at that talk from las vegas maybe they could put that link up again 
But as far as the difference in the coverage from uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, even when we started to have planes, we started to have aircraft in 19... 19- 44 that they started doing aircraft reconnaissance. So that's the link for a talk I gave for Heartland out in Las Vegas and talks about the, you know, our hurricanes getting worse because of climate change. And that's my house in Hurricane Andrew. Yes. <laughs> and they can see my Hurricane Andrew story and that link on the bottom. And by the way, that little girl there is 30 years old now. And not only that, the house where I was living in it was owned by my in-laws, so they had to bulldoze it because it was devastated. They sold the property. Nobody ever built on it again. Whoever bought that property, it is a vacant lot 30 years later. I should have put a little Hurricane Andrew shrine there. But the but the issue is, and they can go back to that other link with the, uh, the talk. The issue is that even at the beginning when we were flying with the, with the hurricane hunters out there, they the instruments they would do it they had someone kind of at the bottom of the plane who would look at the sea surface and try and determine how strong the storm was from the sea surface right that that, that, that wind strength by proxy right then we started to look at instruments on the plane and those instruments got better and better and better but then we got the gps drop wind sons in 1997 and i was on the flight when they first did that in east pacific in hurricane guillermo and it literally, we weren't planning to drop them in the eye wall. One of the scientists, Mike Black, passed away now. In fact, his ashes, just for interest, uh, he was a he was one who pioneered so many things. And we dropped his ashes in the middle of Hurricane Michael a few years ago. And he was a dear friend of ours. And I'll have to not talk about him because I'll get emotional. But the he said to one of the other scientists, James Franklin, he said, hey, what about we drop some of the songs in the eye wall? We'd never done that before. It was a brand new instrument. And James said, yeah, we have we have enough songs. Let's do it. It blew everybody away, changed everything. So now for the first time, we can not only see the profile of the winds, how the winds change with height from the plane down to the surface, we can actually see the winds at the surface directly measured by these songs. It's like a Ray Winson balloon in reverse. Instead of going up, yeah. it goes down. So we started to see these winds at the surface. And by the way, we also found out that about three, 400 feet above the surface, it was not unusual to see winds a whole category stronger. So 30 story and higher buildings can experience a category stronger storm up at that level, that upper level. But we started to see this stuff at the surface. Now, Andrew, when it came ashore, we thought it was a category four. That's how it was in the books for years. But based on the data we had from the Joplin songs, it was changed to a category five 10 years later. Not because we had those in Andrew, this is how science works, but because using the drop sons and doing a lot of studies in drop sons and storms, they change the formula they use to change the aircraft max winds down to the surface. Mm -hmm. So say you got 100 knots at the aircraft, well, they would say, oh, that's 72 knots at the surface if we're flying at five or 10,000 feet. Well, now they knew that for a strong storm, when you're in the convection, that could change to from 100 knots, maybe just to 82 knots. So you're not reducing it as much. Well, that was all they needed for Andrew because it had pretty strong winds in the flight level data. The Air Force kept flying even as it was making landfall because this was such an important event. So they just changed it with a new parameter. So these instruments we have now are just absolutely amazing. They keep getting better. Even the little, the man powered, that's a whole story in itself. It, the one we were using was called a coyote. It had a wingspan of about, I'm guessing, five feet, five and a half feet. It looked like a little rubber band toy. I'm telling you the truth. It was like a drop sawn with wings. And this mm-hmm. thing could be piloted down from the plane, dropped from the plane, get near the surface where we don't want to be, and fly around for about an hour in Category 4 winds, and we could steer it. I was just amazing. Now they have one that will last for a few hours and we can get very, very valuable data from down there. But all this is new, new stuff. We even had a drone that flew at 50, I'm sorry, 65,000 feet. The Global Hawk could fly over the hurricane. We fly through them, through the storms, but it would fly over the hurricane, drop sounds all the way from the top of the troposphere, even into the stratosphere and get more measurements. It could fly out there for 24 hours. Just so many instrumentations to measure the things better. And all those things, by the way, all these flights, all the data, 
the stuff that has improved our hurricane forecast comes from better and faster computers, better hurricane models that you can do on the better computers, better understanding of the nuances of the storm, because we have to decide, well, what are the physics we're going to put in the model? Cloud physics, the droplets, the ice part, everything, all that has to go into the model to decide what happens with the hurricane. And a lot of that information comes from our hurricane flights. And I work with a top-notch team at the Hurricane Research Division, and we collaborate with scientists at universities and other even government and university think tanks around the world and come up with this stuff. So it, it's not easy. Even when we put a new instrument on the plane, when we first had the drop sounds on the plane, there was almost knockdown drag outs on, well, are these really sustained winds? Are these instantaneous winds? Are they, you know, what are we really measuring until we finally came to a conclusion on that? So there's a lot of work that even gets those instruments to properly measure things on the plane. So I just say kudos to the people at the Hurricane Research Division, the Aircraft Operations Center. Uh, they're in Lakeland now, which is going to get probably some impact from the storm. I assure you those planes did not land there today. But all those people, and then the Hurricane Center. I, this is just the side plug, because the Hurricane Center, these guys are professionals. Yes, they are. They know what they're doing, and they care about the public. You have a lot of people get on and they want ratings. They want people to watch their program. The Hurricane Center wants good information to get out to the public and so that they can properly respond to the storm. And I have seen these guys, when they prepare their next outlook, they wrestle over words. There was a storm that went, at Hurricane Allen in 1980, went from Cat 5 to Cat 3 to Cat 5 to Cat 3. And the first time it went from Cat 5 to Cat 3, they said, we can't use the word weaken. Mm -hmm. I yes. have a question here that I want to bring up. This oh, is, go ahead. We can. This is a on. question in from, from Matt Gade, who says, do you think we can control the weather? Now, this has been an age old question. This goes back, you know, literally hundreds of years. People had a belief that witches could forecast and control the weather. I mean, they were people that got burned at the stake for trying to forecast the weather, you know, and they believed that their weather control was, you know, spirits and goblins and all that other rubbish. But do we have any, even a teeny ability to control the weather today? My viewpoint is from a direct standpoint, like a cause and effect where we do something today and it affects something today. I say no. From a long-term standpoint in terms of how we have changed our infrastructure and the way that cities affect weather, such as with the urban heat island and precipitation and things like that, I say yes. But I don't think we have any control knob where we can just dial anything in and make weather happen or not happen. Do you? Okay. Well, when I first joined the lab in Miami, it was called the National Hurricane and Experimental Meteorological Laboratory. Say that three times on your head. And we had the I have to, the face program. I have to think of the name. The face program there. And this was, they were going out there and seeding thunderstorms mm -hmm. and measuring. And it was a very careful experiment. You had some of the top scientists there. They were not trying to pull. They had double blind studies. The planes didn't know if they were dropping real silver iodide or not. We had one of the top scientists, by the way, you know, the cat category scale is the Safford Simpson scale. Simpson is Robert Simpson, who used to be director of the Hurricane Center and was responsible for even creating the place I work. His wife is Joanne Simpson. They're both passed away now. She was she was an incredible scientist, first female doctorate meteorologist, I think, uh, University mm -hmm. of Chicago. I, I met her once, a fantastic right. lady. Oh, she's an incredible one. And uh, by the way, do you know what she said about man-made climate change oh yeah toward the end of her career when she had nothing left to lose you know where tenure wasn't a problem and funding wasn't a problem when she'd retired she came out and basically said eh not there well this is a, this is very close to her quote and i got to know her as well from down here in miami she said you know all this stuff about well that back then it was global warming anthropogenic global warming she said we're basing it all in on models on the climate models, and we know how bad those models are. Those models, we cannot reliably predict an El Nino event three to five months in advance with the models. I say reliably. It's not the models are worthless, not that they're not doing anything, they're getting better, but they're still not up there where I would trust 50 and 100 years. But back to where was I with all that? We're talking uh, oh, about her statement. 
yeah, yeah. that was her statement. So wh where was I before that? Bring me back. Bring me back. And we're uh, talking about the ability oh, changing of us the to weather. control the weather. So these were top, top scientists. And they found, if I recall, very little signal. I won't say nothing, but very little signal. But then I was also involved in our lab when we were doing Project Storm Fury. Project Storm Fury, we were going out and trying to seed the hurricanes. And we were seeding the hurricanes because if we seeded it outside the radius of max winds, it was to try and make an outer wall that therefore would lessen the intensity even by 10 or 15%. And we went out there and did that. Well, to find hurricanes in the right area, then it got very political. What if it gets stronger? What if it moves in this area and they blame it on us? We literally had to get permission from the White House at one point. And so they couldn't do many, but then some research, because we're very honest with our research, and Dr. Hugh Willoughby, who I mentioned before, who drew the diagram that I showed with the, with the impact, he had to write the RIP article on Project Storm Fury because we found out, and this gets technical, there wasn't enough super cold water droplets in the upper atmosphere there where we were seeding, and there was so much natural variability, it was almost impossible to distinguish what we would do. But it was mainly the absence of these super cool water droplets. So we've tried. I know of no study that has done substantial amount change in weather. Now, people talk about hurricanes. They say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And on our FAQ page, you can look at Tropical Cyclone FAQ from the Hurricane Research Division. We have a whole section on modifying storms. They say, why don't you uh, put a bunch of ice out there? Why don't you put a bunch of oil on the surface? Why don't you blow an atomic bomb? And almost all of those neglect the incredible power that's in a hurricane. A hurricane out there in the ocean, the latent heat release, and we can explain that if you want, the latent heat release in one day could power the electrical needs of the United States for about six months. These are massive, huge amounts of energy. I forgot the number of bombs. It's like 420 megaton bombs. I mean, it, it's yeah. just- this... there, There's been crazy ideas that have been floated in the past where we could drop a nuclear bomb on a hurricane and cause it to dissipate. Well, Which, it's not even it, it's not even remotely feasible. Number one, the, who wants to spread fallout all over the absolutely. place? Absolutely. But secondly, the amount of energy from one nuclear bomb compared to the whole hurricane is infinitesimally small. Right, well, well, listen, you know what, you remember what lady fingers are? I haven't seen those in a long time. Little, little tiny, tiny firecrackers. Uh, it'd be like setting off a lady finger. I mean, you know, the hurricane would just kind of yawn and say, what else you got? So we, th this is the thing, we want to change it rather than prepare and adapt for it. And let me mention another thing with the man-made climate change stuff. And I, I see where, I don't know how long we're going to go here, but we're having fun. Uh, people are watching and enjoying it and getting information, but the it keeps coming up, well, it's going to get much worse because of rising sea levels. Well, first of all, there's lots of reasons for the rise in sea levels, which we won't go into here. But the nominal rise in sea level over time, and there's natural re reasons, some people would cite anthropogenic, but let's just go with the natural, is so small compared to the storm surge and even the tide. And what happens is, say 100 years from now, for whatever reason, the sea level in a certain area has gone up by eight inches. Well, they've already adjusted to that eight inches. So the storm surge, I, the storm surge is something that comes immediately with the hurricane, but the sea level rise, it's already there. They're not gonna worry about that. They're gonna say, oh, this is worse because of the sea level rise. No, it's whatever the sea level is at that point is what they're dealing with. So anyway, right. that's just the side point. One of the things that uh, we had Hurricane Sandy a few years ago, I believe it was in 2012, and Hurricane Sandy was uh, called Superstorm Sandy because you know it was supersized, it was extra big. And but one of the things that that was claimed about that is that in New York City, the flooding that they experienced was enhanced by the increased sea level. Well. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but we're talking about what they had a 28 foot storm surge and they had a king tide going on at the same time due to the moon. And they and then the amount of sea level rise since 1850 at the battery in New York was on the order of, of maybe about 
I think it was like nine or 10 inches. So, you know, compare that to the whole storm surge and the tide and everything else. And it's not really that big of a factor. I mean, what's the difference between having 28 feet worth of storm surge versus 30 feet? I don't, I don't think it was, I don't think it was 28 feet. Yeah. Uh, it, maybe it was in certain areas. That sounds like a high number, but uh, pretty high number. But the issue was it was on the order of a lot of feet <laughs> compared to inches and I could tell. By the way, let me insert here. Uh, although I work with NOAA, I'm here uh, not representing NOAA. And some of the views I say are not the official views of NOAA. Although I greatly respect NOAA, and I'm very grateful to be working with them. So I'm here on my own time. So I once looked at a study and to review the study, and it showed Sandy, since you mentioned that, uh, and said, "Gee, what would Sandy have been like 50 years from now with warmer sea surface temperatures?" That means warmer predicted by their their climate models. So they did it, and Sandy was this incredible superstorm, just much much stronger, much much worse. So I wrote on there, I said, "Well, you have one big problem with this study, is all you did was increase the sea surface temperatures. Even in the climate models, the atmosphere changes. That it even takes higher temperatures to get the same hurricane." And sometimes you even have more unfavorable winds that don't allow the hurricane to develop. So if you do it with that, you're not going to get a superstorm. You might get something even just the same or less. So that's the thing. It's not just about the sea surface temperatures. It's the atmospheric conditions. The sea surface temperatures are plenty warm most of the time during August and November, October to spawn hurricanes. It has to be the atmosphere that allows those things to form. And there's difference, by the way, just for our viewers, there's the sea surface temperature is just that top layer of the ocean. And there's ocean heat content. Ocean heat content is related to what's below the surface. So sometimes in the Gulf, and this storm certainly went over them, you have pockets of very deep, warm water. And these pockets, when the hurricane goes over, it churns up the ocean. So you end up with water coming up from below. Well, normally it's much cooler. So the storm can't intensify as much. But if you have a deep pocket of warm water, the storm keeps intensifying. Almost like if you have two, uh, two stoves, uh, two burners, and one you, you have them both red hot, and you put two pots of water on those two burners. So if you put the pots of water on them, and one you turn off immediately, the other one you leave on. So the one you turn off, the water is going to absorb that heat, and that's it. And then it's done. Yep. But the other one you leave on, those are those deep pockets. And that's what allows some of these storms to rapidly intensify. I just did about three seminars in one there. So what do we want to do now? Well, at this point, I think we've kind of exhausted all the different topics that we've uh, come over. <laughs> um, we've had a great chat here. Uh, our, our readers and viewers have come up with a lot of good questions. And um, basically, the bottom line is, is that, yes, we're having a major hurricane run through Florida right now. No, climate change is not to blame specifically for it. And uh, a lot of the infrastructure and building in places where they shouldn't be are going to be responsible for a lot of the damage that we're going to see. I hope everyone in the path of this storm stays safe and out of harm's way. And I want to remind everyone that after we end this interactive broadcaster, we will continue to stream the live radar uh, from our system so that you can watch the progress of the storm uh, throughout the day and into tonight. We'll probably end the live stream once the hurricane passes through the entire uh, state of Florida and goes and off think, the Atlantic. I, I do a few closing words as well here. Uh, it's just, I'm so grateful you're putting up the live radar stream because a radar is something people really need to watch as this progresses because when these orange areas, red areas, these bands hit your area, that's when you're gonna get the strongest winds. Right. And I don't know if you wanna put up my impact slide one more time as we close, because as this thing moves across the state, even if it weakens the tropical storm intensity, some places are gonna get hurricane force gusts, lots of rain, flooding, tornadoes that we've been talking about, there's a lot of impact to go. So we're gonna see incredible devastation at the landfall point due to the winds, the storm surge, and the rainfall. But inland, we're also going to see a lot of damage. Not the same devastation, we'll see a lot of damage. And the storm has a long way to go. So stay tuned to hurricanes.gov, that's hurricanes plural, .gov, the National Hurricane Center site for up-to-date information. As I mentioned before, they can go to YouTube or Facebook 
and search for National Hurricane Center and they'll see live video updates and different posts because you really want to get it from them. Sometimes the TV meteorologists do a good job. Some of them are great and some of them don't know what they're talking about and give wrong information. So you want to get it from the Hurricane Center. I just wish and we our prayers are with all the people in the path of the storm. Thank you for having me on today. It was a pleasure having you on. You brought a lot of great content to the discussion. I appreciate you taking the time. For Anthony Watts and the rest of the Heartland Institute team, along with Stanley Goldenberg, I thank you for watching. And we're going to go now back to our regular live stream of radar, which we will continue throughout the next 24 to 36 hours. Bye-bye.